Here is a standard header file. We have a class called Big Class that holds a pointer to a complex engine. Naturally, we included the complex engine header at the top, so the compiler knows what that type is. But here is the problem. The complex engine header might include a header for a vector, a string, an algorithm, and 20 other files. Because we included it here in the big class header, every single file in your project that includes big class also silently includes complex engine and all of its dependencies. The solution is to delete the include and replace it with the line class complex engine. This is a forward declaration. It tells the compiler that complex engine is a class without defining its internal members yet. But why does this work? Because the engine member variable is a pointer. On a 64-bit system, every pointer is exactly 8 bytes. The compiler doesn't need to know the size of the complex engine class or its internal members to allocate memory for this pointer. It just needs to know it's a type. This breaks the dependency chain. So changes to complex engine won't force files, including the big class header, to recompile. Just a heads up. You might run into an undefined type error when you compile big class CCPP file. This only happens if you try to use the engine object, as the compiler needs to see the full class definition to call its methods. To resolve this, we move the include directive here into the source file. Ideally, you want to forward declare in the header and only include in the CPP file. This keeps the header dependencies clean. Forward declarations work outside of your own classes too, like with the standard library. Look at this. We want to overload the stream operator for logging. To get the studio stream type, most people just include the iostream header. But the iostream header is massive. It contains static objects and extensive template definitions. And with the include directive, we are pasting all of that complex code into our header just to use the std ostream type name in a function signature. This slows down compilation speed. The compiler has to parse those thousands of lines over and over again. The C++ standard library provides the iosfwd header file. It contains forward declarations for ostream, iStream, stringstream, and more. This header file is significantly smaller. Again, inside your CPP file, you will need the full iostream header to actually print things, but your header file remains clean. If you are developing on Windows, sooner or later you will need the Windows header file. Whether you are managing memory or simply creating a message box, this file is usually mandatory. Let's see just how expensive this include is. We are going to use a compiler switch to visualize the cost. I'm setting the compiler to preprocess to a file. This stops compilation after the text replacement phase and dumps the result into a file. Let's see what the Windows header gave us. Look at this. Over 70,000 lines of code. Pure text that the compiler has to parse. And this happens for every file that includes this header. We can strip out the bloat using this macro. Win32, lean and mean. This tests the Microsoft header to exclude APIs like cryptography and sockets. Let's check the difference. We just cut the line count about in half. If this header is included in a lot of places in your project, you just potentially saved the compiler from parsing millions of lines of useless code. This is safe to do provided you don't specifically need the cryptography, socket or other APIs excluded by this macro. Let's look at the top of a header file. You see a directive, pragma once. Historically, C++ projects relied on manual include guards, a practice that is still standard in C. Technically, these do the same thing. They prevent the file from being pasted twice into the same translation unit. However, Pragma once has a subtle performance benefit in modern compilers. When the compiler sees an include guard, it has to open and parse the header file to verify the guard. With the Pragma once, the compiler can mark this file path as seen in its internal cache. It doesn't even need to open the file from the disk the second time it encounters an include for it. 
it is more concise and can offer minor performance benefits, unless you have a specific requirement to support legacy systems, Pragma Once is the practical choice. Look at this class, we have a couple of private members, a std vector of strings and an integer. They are private, so nobody outside this class can access them, but these members still create a build dependency, including this big class header, automatically pulls in the vector and the string header files. Also changing a member variable alters the memory layout and size of the class even if it's private. Any source file including this header relies on that size definition. So the compiler must recompile those files to match the new layout. This creates a large dependency chain that increases build time. The fix here is the pimple idiom. It lets us bundle all those heavy private members into a struct and just keep a single pointer to it in the header. Pimple stands for pointer to implementation. So literally a pointer to the struct that holds our private members. First we remove the previously included headers. Then we replace the private members with a forward declaration. We forward declare a struct called implementation and the std unique pointer to that struct. Now the big class header is much smaller. That's because the compiler has no idea what the implementation struct contains and it doesn't care, it only sees a pointer. Next, we move the implementation details into the source file. So here we define the implementation struct. We also moved the include directives for headers here. Now if we change the implementation struct by adding members or changing types, it only affects the big class cpp file. The big class header file remains untouched, so any other files, including the big class header, won't need to recompile. However, there is one detail to watch out for. If you don't explicitly define the destructor in the cpp file, the compiler will give you an error saying it can delete an incomplete type. This occurs because the default destructor is generated where the header is included, but since the struct is only forward declared, the compiler can't see the full definition required to delete it. To fix this, you must declare the big class destructor in the header and implement it in the cpp file after the implementation struct is defined. By putting default here in the cpp file, the compiler can see the full definition of implementation. So now it can generate the correct cleanup code. A word of caution. Pimple isn't free. It forces the CPU to jump to a different memory location to find your data which is slightly slower than accessing it directly. A rule of thumb is to use this technique to fix build times on heavy classes, but don't use it on small objects that need to be extremely fast. Let's talk about templates. They are often a major cause of slow compile times. Every time you create a vector holding a custom type, the compiler has to build a brand new version of the vector class just for it. If you use this same vector in multiple files, the compiler generates the code for each one. The linker eventually cleans up the duplicates, but the compilation work has already been done, so you essentially already wasted time. We can avoid this redundancy by using the extern template keywords. This tells the compiler that the template is defined in another file, so it skips generating the code here. Then in exactly one cpp file, we explicitly instantiate the template without the extern keyword. This forces the compiler to generate the code once in this location. Now in all your other files, you just include the header with the extern template keywords. This way the compiler skips the generation step, Linking simply points to the one existing copy. This prevents the compiler from repeating the same task across the project. As with most optimizations, there are drawbacks of course. When you hide the template body in another file, the compiler often loses the ability to inline small functions. For simple containers like studvector, this can actually hurt runtime performance. So use this technique for heavy, complex templates where compilation speed is more important than runtime performance.
Now let's configure the compiler. By default, Visual Studio compiles files one by one. This means that even with a multi-core CPU, the build process is single-threaded. We can change this to compile multiple files at the same time. Here in the project settings, we just need to find the multiprocessor compilation and switch it to yes. This switch tells the compiler to launch a separate process for every core on your CPU. Because each CPP file is an independent translation unit, they can be compiled in parallel. This allows the compiler to process multiple files in parallel. On a 12 core machine, it can build up to 12 files simultaneously which reduces the total build time. The trade-off here is system responsiveness. Since the compiler utilizes all available CPU cores, the rest of your system might feel sluggish until the build completes. Next, we have pre-compiled headers. This feature is designed to prevent the compiler from processing the same heavy libraries over and over. Even with our previous optimizations, Many files still include standard libraries like the vector or string header files. This means the compiler has to reports these headers for every single source file. The idea is to compile these common headers a single time. The compiler saves the state to a file, which is then efficiently reused by every other source file in the project. First, we create a header the pre-compiled header. Here we include all the stable libraries and headers that rarely change. Now we need to configure the build. Here in the project properties we navigate to the pre-compiled header section. First we change the setting to use. This tells the compiler that by default all files in the project should simply load the pre-compiled header. Here is the logic. The project is set to use the pre-compiled header, but the pre-compiled header's CPP file is the special exception. It is set to create the pre-compiled header. When you build, the compiler processes the pre-compiled header's CPP first, then generates a huge binary file. Finally, every other file skips parsing the vector header and just loads that binary dump. Keep in mind that every CPP file must now start by including the pre-compiled header. If you forget, the compiler will give an error. It takes a little effort to maintain, but it can make the build significantly faster. Another option is a Unity build. The default build process involves reading hundreds of separate files, which adds up. Unity builds merge these into one large file, allowing the compiler to process everything in one go. This cuts out the repetitive work of opening and closing files, letting the compiler run uninterrupted. However, this comes with a pretty big drawback. Here, if file A and file B both have a static variable, named counter, they wouldn't conflict because they are separate translation units. But in a Unity build, they are pasted into the same file, so you will likely get a redefinition error. We can resolve this by replacing static with anonymous namespaces. This properly encapsulates the variables, so they are in a different scope. This prevents conflicts within the Unity file. But hold on, there are more trade-offs. While Unity builds can drastically speed up full rebuilds, they can slow down incremental changes. If you modify a single isolated file, the compiler must rebuild the entire combined unit, which takes longer than compiling just the specific file you changed. Let's also look at the linker. By enabling incremental linking in project settings, we can ensure that small code changes don't force a complete link of the executable. Instead, the linker only updates the parts that changed. Incremental linking works by adding extra space or padding between functions. When you modify a function, the linker writes the new code into that available space and updates a lookup table. This allows it to patch the file rather than rewriting it entirely. This is important. Do not use this for release builds. The jump table adds a small runtime performance penalty. This is purely for compilation speed. Also, this is typically enabled by default for debug builds, but it is worth verifying to ensure you aren't losing time unnecessarily. 
For release builds, we typically use link time optimization to maximize runtime speed. In MSVC, this feature is called link time code generation, or LTCG. It allows the compiler to inline functions across different CPP files. The downside is that this takes a lot of computing power. Because the linker has to recheck everything, to find these optimizations, the build process takes much longer. If you are actively working in release configuration, perhaps for profiling, you can optimize your workflow by changing the setting to use fast link time code generation. This mode provides runtime performance comparable to full optimization, but significantly reduces build times by only reprocessing the parts of the code that actually changed. It is a pretty neat middle ground. There are also a few external things you can try. On Windows, real-time antivirus scanning can often interfere with the build process. Since the compiler writes so many new files to the disk, the antivirus may try to scan them during compilation. This scanning can slow down your compilation speeds. So you might want to test adding an exclusion for your build folder. You can also look into alternative build systems. Ninja is a very popular, lightweight option that is often much faster at local, parallel builds. If you are working in a large team, you might even look at distributed build tools like FastBuild or IncrediBuild, which use the network to compile code across multiple machines. You could also consider setting up a compiler cache, like Ccache. This tool speeds up the build process by caching previous compilations and detecting when the same compilation is being done again. So if you recompile code that hasn't changed, it pulls the object file from the cache instantly, instead of making the compiler do the work again. If you found this helpful, please leave a like and subscribe for more C++ content. If you want to support these deep dives directly, consider becoming a channel member. Now, optimizing is useless if you can't measure the difference accurately. To learn how to benchmark your code properly using the Chrono library, check out this video next.